Hey everyone, uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, transformer-based language models. But before I get into talking about those, and there's a variety of them, I want to say a word about non-transformer contextualized word embeddings. Um, so recall from last week, we talked about a model called word to vec um, and uh, for a given model trained on a given corpus, um, the same word would always have the same embedding, uh, regardless of the context that it was used in um, for a particular inference example. So if you looked up the embedding for the word bank, there would be just one embedding um, from a given training corpus, even though bank can have very different meanings depending on the context. Um, and so we talked a little bit about how when we got to the transformer, we were going to see uh, contextualized word embeddings um, where the uh, representation for a word differs depending on the context in which it was used. Uh, but of course, you don't have to have a transformer uh, model to have contextualized embeddings. And this um, idea actually uh, slightly predates the transformer. Um, and um, so in particular, um, there was a model called ELMO, um, which, you know, in a little bit we'll see BERT. Um, and so I think ELMO started the um, uh, Muppet naming convention for language models. Um, so ELMO was a prominent model in the development of contextualized word embeddings. Um, it's a language model whose objective is to predict the next word in a sequence. Um, and in addition to be to being important um, in the development of contextualized representations of words. It also helped to popularize the idea that you could use a pre-trained language model to create representations that would then be used for various other downstream tasks. And so once you had this language model that was trained to predict the next word, you could get vector representations out of that model and use them to do other things. Okay, so ELMO is based on an LSTM, um, which recall is a type of recurrent neural network um, that takes an input sequentially um, and then generates the output sequentially. Um, and um, so uh, word by word, um, you would feed in um, a sentence. So here, let's stick to, um, and then that uh, goes sequentially um, through the layers of the LSTM, right? Um, and so remember, as you feed in each word into this model, you have these um, hidden states that you're keeping track of, um, and those interact with the input word that you're feeding in, um, and you use that to predict the word that comes next, um, which you just do by using a softmax over all the words that are in your vocabulary. Um, and so this is a visual representation of Elmo from a JL Mars blog, um, which again is a really fantastic resource. Um, and we'll see, um, uh, you know, we saw his illustrations of the transformer and we'll see some of his illustrations of other models today. All right, um, so Elmo is bidirectional to allow the context from both directions to matter. Um, and, um, you know, so in one direction, you're feeding the sentence in and predicting which one come, which, which word comes next in kind of the forward direction. And um, in uh, the uh, backwards part of it, you're predicting the what word comes next, but doing that by feeding the sentence in backwards. Um, and so that you can see that depicted here. Um, and, the reason for this is if you just trained it in the forward direction, um, when you're trying to predict what word comes next, you can only use the previous context. Um, and so the idea um, with a bidirectional LSTM um, is that when it's trained on the sentence fed in backwards, then you're getting to use the context uh, from the other direction. Um, so ELMO creates contextualized embeddings by concatenating the hidden states and the initial embeddings across both the forwards and the backwards LSTM, and then it takes a weighted sum of the hidden states and the initial embedding vectors. Um, and so that is illustrated visually here. 
And so you can see that you have um, the hidden layers of the network and you have them going in both a forwards and a backwards direction. Um, so you feed and stick and predict which word comes next and you feed and stick and predict which word comes previously with the backwards language model. And you can cat concatenate the hidden states from that as well as the initial vectors that you feed in and then multiply each vector by a weight um, which will vary based on the task that you want to do. Um, and we'll talk a little bit when we get to the transformer about you know, how different hidden layers are going to vary. Um, but there's just some weights that you multiply these by. Um, and now you uh, sum them up using their weighted sum. Um, and uh, that gives you your representation of that word. Uh, which is going to depend on the context. Um, and to create the initial embeddings, the model combines character level embeddings. All right, um, and so that is, um, that's Elmo. Um, and so this is using, again, it's using an LSTM. And so um, the representations are being generated by feeding in the sequence sequentially um, and predicting what comes next and as you advance through the sentence or, or go backwards through the sentence in the case of the um, the backwards language model you're carrying along um, these hidden states um, that are representing the context um, and so this is very much taking kind of what we saw um, last week and using it to create these contextualized embeddings and this was quite an influential model all right, um, but now I want to come and talk about the transformer language models, uh, which have really completely taken over NLP. Um, it's a little bit hard to imagine a scenario where you would use an LSTM instead of using a transformer-based language model. You know, they've really come to predominate. They're straightforward. Um, uh, for the most part to use. And so um, for anybody who wants to do NLP applications, um, transformer language models are central. And I'm going to go through a lot of them, you know, and we'll have a Redux um, at the end where I'll talk about what you might want to use. Um, some of these um, are shown mostly for historical interest to kind of understand how this field has evolved, um, whereas others of them are things that you would very reasonably, you know, potentially um, use. All right. Um, and so the first example of a standalone transformer language model, to, my mo to, to, to the best of my knowledge, um, was GPT um, by OpenAI. Um, and so if you recall from last class, uh, the original transformer contained a language model, which was the decoder side of it. It was predicting which word comes next. Um, and it does this by, you know, even though the sequence is all fed in together, um, it does this by masking future tokens. And so the model is not, al not allowed to attend to the future tokens in the sequence because its objective is to predict them. Um, and so the decoder language model does not have to be combined with the encoder for machine translation. It can just be used as a standalone language model. And that's what uh, GPT did. All right, um, so this is just a visual representation of the mask self-attention that we saw last class um, from the decoder side of the model. Um, so the original GPT stacked 12 transformer decoder blocks. Um, and since there's no encoder, it obviously um, omitted the encoder decoder attention layers. And the training objective was just to predict the next word. Um, and so this is a visual representation of what GPT looked like. Um, it had its 12 uh, decoder stacks where each of those decoder blocks is just like the decoder that we saw last lecture from the original transformer, except it's going to admit the encoder decoder attention because there is no encoder when you use this as a standalone language model. And then training it, you're just using the softmax over all um, words in the vocabulary to predict which word comes next. And as you recall from seeing the transformer last class, this is very different from the 
LSTM that we just saw with Elmo because all the words are being fed in in sequence and then it's allowing self-attention between them. I'm sorry, all the words are being fed in at the same time versus fed in sequentially. All right, um, so um, inputs can be transformed to configure the model to perform different downstream tasks. And this is something that we'll see is generally the case with transformer language models. So it can do classification. So you feed in a single text um, and then pass it to a linear classification layer. It can do entailment um, where you have, um, you want to know whether or not your premise entails your hypothesis. And then you just have like a separator token there to let it know that you're feeding in two pieces of text and then get a linear layer. You can compute the similarity between two pieces of text, um, multiple choice, etc. And so you can do lots of downstream tasks. And we'll see this again with BERT in just a minute, where it's, I think, particularly true. All right. Um, so that was the original GPT. Um, nobody uses the original GPT anymore. There's now a GPT-2 and a GPT-3, um, which essentially work very similarly. They're just much um, larger models. Um, and uh, so again, GPT-2 and GPT-3 are stacking the decoder blocks. Um, and well, what do you use GPT-2 and GPT-3 for? Um, well, since they're a model that's trained to generate what word comes next. Um, they're going to be really good for text generation tasks. You give it a prompt and it will continue the text, right? Which is exactly kind of what GPT chat does, which is kind of a chat application of GPT-3. Um, you give it a prompt um, and it continues the text. Um, so unlike the other models, I think all the other models that we're discussing, um, they're open source. GPT-3 is proprietary, um, but there are open versions of GPT-3. Um, so Meta AI uh, has a model called OPT, which and they have versions of it that range from only 125 million parameters all the way up to 175 billion parameters, which is the same size as GPT-3. Um, you can download models of up to 66 billion parameters in size. Um, now, you know, most of you guys are not going to use OPT with billions of parameters um, to serve a model with 175 billion parameters that takes something like 360 gigs of GPU memory, which is probably going to put you out close to half a million dollars in a computer in a server room. So realistically, you're not going to use um, you're not going to use OPT 175 billion parameters. Um, unless you have access to kind of a very beefy machine, um, which I doubt any of us do. But um, the smaller models you might use, um, GPT-2 is also public, um, and it's much smaller, and like a lot of people have worked with it. So GPT-2 can be a really good place to start in working with a generative model. Um, and it's something that, that we've worked with. It's well documented. It's pretty user-friendly to work with. Um, Hugging Face also has an open, um, GPT-3-like model called Bloom. All right. Um, so GPT-3 is, as I said, it's this massive, massive model, like 175 billion parameters, just kind of mind-blowing in its massiveness. I think it stacks 96 transformer blocks. Um, and the context window is 2,048 tokens, um, which is a large context window. With like a standard model that you all are more likely to use, you're gonna have a context window more like 512. Um, so you can feed in really long texts, um, and it's just massive. Um, it took 355 GP, GPU years to train at a cost of $4.6 million. Um, GPT chat is a much smaller model derived from GPT-3 for chat applications. All right. Um, so at first, you know, if you say, okay, we're going to use a transformer for a language model, it seems most intuitive to stack decoder blocks uh, because the decoder is a language model that predicts what word comes next. Um, 
but if you just use the decoder blocks, the language model is not bidirectional. Um, and, you know, obviously that is <laughs> fine if your objective is text generation, because the whole point of what you want to do is to predict like what word comes next. You're prompting it and getting it to predict text. Okay. So like, obviously like that's what you want. Um, but for a lot of other tasks, where you're trying to get kind of representations of a text or representations of specific tokens within text, um, it's really like a downside not to be able to use the bidirectional context um, because um, you know that's that's important. Okay, and um, if you wanted to use that with a decoder model. Um, you could feed the sequence in backwards, which is what we just saw with Elmo, which is a bidirectional LSTM, but then you need to a way to combine the forwards and backwards representations, and that's really not obvious. I mean, like, um, uh, Elmo just concatenated them, but, um, you know, it's not, it's not obvious that that's um, kind of how you would want to do that combination. Um, and, um, in contrast, remember that the encoder blocks, um, uh, they have um, unmasked self-attention. And so you can see both the a forward and the backwards context. Um, so, um, you know, that, that has the advantage that you can see both of those, uh, both of those directions, um, which if you want to produce a contextualized representation of a word in a given sequence like you would you would want because the stuff that comes after it um, is also influencing the context and is influencing kind of the meaning of that word. Um, so we'll now see a very influential paper whose innovation was to realize that encoder blocks can be used to create a bidirectional language model through masking. Okay. And so this paper is BERT, um, which stands for Bidirectional Encoder Representations for Transformers. Um, and it marked a major, major leap forward in NLP. Um, and so let's kind of break down this acronym. Bidirectional refers to the fact that it considers context from both directions, as with a bidirectional LSTM, when it's creating a, a contextualized representation for a word. Uh, the model can see both what comes after and what comes before. Um, encoder refers to the fact that it stacks encoder transformer blocks. Um, and really its most remarkable feature is creating representations that can be used for a very diverse set of downstream tasks. You know, so as we saw with GPT-3, you know, you could use those representations for diverse downstream tasks as well, but GPT mostly makes sense as a generative model to generate text. Um, whereas if your goal is not to generate text, but to get representations of text that you then use to do something else like classification, etc., cetera, uh, like named entity recognition, like you're going to really want to see the context in both directions. All right. Um, so the transformer encoder reads the sequence all at once, and that makes it bidirectional. Um, but um, so how are you going to train this thing? Because you're not going to predict what words comes next because you can see what word comes next. Um, instead, what BERT does is to train the encoder as a language model by using an approach called mask language modeling. And so 15% of tokens are sampled at random. And of those, 80% are replaced with the mask token, 10% are replaced with a random word, and 10% are kept the same. And the model is trained by predicting these 15% um, of tokens. Um, 15% why, um, not clear, um, but it seems to work. Um, they didn't report experiments on this, you know, presumably they just chose something that seemed reasonable. Okay, and so here again, we have courtesy of Jay Alamar, a visual representation. Um, and so you see, first of all, that it, you feed in a token called CLS, that's the class token. And we'll see how that's trained, that representation is trained in a minute. Um, and then you feed in um, each of the words or tokens um, in the sequence, um, and then randomly mask 15% of them. And then um, 
use the output of the mask word's position to predict the mask word. Um, so you're gonna get a representation for that word and then use that with the feed forward network in the softmax, just as we've seen kind of in the context of all the other language models to predict uh, what word that refers to. Um, so the model predicts all words, but only the mass ones are used to compute the loss. All right, a second part of the training objective is next sentence prediction. And so the model receives pairs of sentences as inputs and predicts whether the second sentence comes directly after the first in the original corpus. Um, and half the time it is the next sentence and the other half of the time it is chosen randomly. Um, and so it does this by inserting the class token at the beginning of the first sentence. Um, and then it's gonna use that uh, to do next sentence prediction and training. Um, and then in the trained model, that class token is gonna give a representation of the text. So the class token connects with a fully connected layer to an output with two classes, is next or not next, instead of to the softmax for every word in the output vocabulary, um, the way that they're doing uh, with uh, the uh, other representations. Um, so here's how the tokens are input at training. Um, so remember in the transformer, we need position embeddings because it's fed in all at once and we need the position embeddings to keep track of the order in the sequence. And then they feed in these uh, segment embeddings um, because remember they're feeding in two sentences at a time. And then they feed in the token embeddings and you add all of those up um, to get the input. All right, um, so recall that this is the training architecture. You have a mask sentence A and a mask sentence B, um, and you feed them into this transformer model, um, and it's passing through multiple encoder blocks, um, and then you get at the kind of last layer, you have representations of each token, which should be very contextualized, um, and you're using those to predict what word has been masked, as well as whether the sentence B is the next sentence or not. And then, you know, what's really kind of like amazing about this and has ha helped it to really kind of revolutionize NLP is that it's very straightforward to take this architecture and fine tune it on specific tasks. So let me show an example of that. Um, in the first, you have a representation of using it to do sentence pair classification. Um, so that's things like uh, natural uh, language inference. Um, so um, does uh, A entail B? Um, and kind of a variety of other tasks that you would want to perform, maybe like semantic similarity um, uh, with pairs of sentences. And so you feed in the pair with a separator token um, and then um, you tune a classifier on the class token um, in order to say, are these two things the same or not? Does A entail B, etc. Whatever kind of the relationship is between those two sentences, you just add a classifier head to the class token um, and fine tune the model for that. Um, you can also have single sentence classification tasks where you feed in just one sentence instead of two sentences concatenated by a separator. So that would be something like sentiment analysis or topic classification. Um, but it's the same principle where you're fine tuning it by stacking a classifier um, for, you know, the sentiment is positive, negative, neutral, for instance, on the class token. Um, Question answering is in panel C. So in question answering, you have a question and then a separator token and a paragraph that contains the answer. And you're looking to identify the span of text in that paragraph where the answer is located. Um, and, um, and so you're just predicting the start and end span um, on the word tokens. Um, and then finally in panel D, um, it's giving an example of named entity recognition. Um, where you're looking for the spans of text that contain um, uh, entities like persons, etc. Um, and again, this is now a token level task um, where your um, your output, you know, is 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 fine tuned um, on um, each of the tokens, um, and you give it a tag 
of whether or not it contains an entity and whether it's the beginning or the end of an entity. Um, and that gives you kind of the spans of text where your entities are located. Um, so this is just another representation of this. Um, and uh, so you see um, Bert and we're feeding in a sentence. And then to do topic classification, we just put a, a classifier, which again is just a feed forward neural network plus a softmax. Um, we use the, the class token um, to, uh, to train a classifier. Um, and here it's asking, is this piece of text spam or not spam? Okay, and so remember that we've stacked multiple encoder blocks and kind of the larger the model, the more encoder blocks we stack. Um, and there's a general consensus um, that the upper layers are more task specific. Um, and so you have a pre-trained model and if you're fine tuning um, a topic classifier on it by um, putting a classifier head onto the class token, um, then it's probably going to be mostly parameters in those top layers um, that are task specific that are changing. Um, and many of the kind of parameters um, earlier in the model are less likely to change, but still we would typically leave them um, free to change in optimizing the model. So there's a paper, how contextualized, are contextualized word representations comparing the geometry of BERT, ELMO, and GPT-2 embeddings. Um, that finds that representations of the same word in different layers are less similar in the upper layer, um, which is suggesting that the upper layers are producing more context-specific representations, you know, which makes sense that each time kind of you pass this representation through another transformer layer, it has, um, you know, it computes self-attention and it's getting richer and richer and more contextualized um, embeddings of the same word that are used in different contexts. Um, and so this is just a summary um, from the BERT paper, and you see the bidirectional nature of it um, as compared to GPT, um, which has mass attention, and so it can't get bidirectional context, and as compared to ELMO, which just has two separate LSTMs, one that's fed forward and one that's fed the sequence backwards, and then just concatenates them. And so I think this figure really nicely sums up um, the differences between these three different approaches. And again, you know, you would use GPT if you need to, or, you know, some other decoder model if you need to generate text, um, but might use a model, you know, akin to BERT um, if you want to get representations from text and then use them for a downstream task like classification, which we just saw here, or like named entity recognition in D, your question answering in C, etc. All right, so there's two versions of BERT, um, and this is not true, not just for BERT, um, but for the overwhelming majority of language models, they have versions like maybe two, maybe more like five, six different versions of different sizes. So the base version has 110 million parameters and the large version has 340 million parameters. So, you know, small compared to GPT-3, but still pretty large. Okay, um, and so you wouldn't actually use BERT um, most likely um, in your research. Um, there's been updates to it. Uh, Roberta in particular was produced by Facebook, now Meta AI Research. And the model is the same as BERT, but the difference is they train on way more data for longer with a larger batch size. And this is a theme in the literature for how to use, for, for, for how to achieve state of the art. Training on more data for longer with as large of a batch size as you can is likely to improve performance. And so it's basically the same model. Um, it's not doing next sentence prediction and it's just, it's trained on uh, way more data. So BERT was trained on about 16 gigabytes of data, which is not that much in the scheme of what language models do nowadays. Um, it was mostly trained on a books corpus, open domain books corpus and Wikipedia. And Roberta adds 104 gigabytes of additional data that comes from Common Crawl News data set, which is 63 million articles totaling 76 gigabytes, web text corpus, which is 38 gigabytes, and stories from Common Crawl. 
Um, it was trained on 1,024 Tesla V100 GPUs. Um, so you guys can, you know, gauge from that statement why, like, Facebook trained this model. Like, people, academics don't generally, like, train la large language models from scratch. Um, we don't have access to that kind of compute, um, but Facebook does. Um, and it results in a 2 to 20% improvement over BERT on different benchmark tasks. And so this is just showing its performance. Um, and you can see, um, you know, again, there's never, ever, ever, ever that I've seen standard errors um, in, or any kind of measure of uncertainty quantification um, in tables like this. Um, but you can see that it's tending to do, um, you know, modestly or in some cases even a little bit more significantly better than BERT. And it kind of makes sense because we know it was trained on more stuff for longer with a bigger batch size, which is, you know, you'll find in many, many, many contexts that that's going to improve your model and that's not really controversial. Okay, so there's um, Roberta Base is 125 million, Roberta Large, 355 million. And then they have these versions trained on MNLI and WSC. So what does that mean? Those are both large models. Um, WSC is a Winograd scheme, uh, which is a pair of sentences that differ in only one or two words and that contain an ambiguity that is resolved in opposite ways in the two sentences and requires the use of uh, knowledge and reasoning. So it would be like the city councilman refused the demonstrators a permit because they you need to predict feared or advocated violence. And so if the word is feared, then they refers to the city council. If it's advocated, it refers to the demonstrators. Um, and then there's um, uh, uh, MNLI, um, which is a crowdsourced corpus of 433,000 sentence pairs annotated with entailment information. So what do I mean by entailment? Um, in entailment, you have a premise and a hypothesis and either the premise is neutral to the hypothesis, it contradicts it, or it entails it. Um, and this is like a very common task for pre-training. And this is actually like um, pretty useful. Um, and so for example, to, to try to do zero shot a uh, topic classification model, we pre-trained on MNLI uh, because it's a huge data set and you can think of topic classification as entailment like this passage is about something um, and if it is like that that's entailment and so you know this might seem a little idiosyncratic but actually pre-training on entailment um, can be um, can be pretty useful for stuff that we might want to do because the model is being forced to learn logic um, and even though we don't care about these particular, you know, um, uh, premises and hypotheses, like the, what it learns about logic could be useful for doing other stuff. All right. So that's Roberta. Um, still Roberta. The basic idea is to approximate the larger network learned by Roberta with a smaller network. Um, so distillation is essentially a compression technique in which a small model is trained to reproduce a large model. Um, and so we're not going to go into, um, how distillation works, uh, but it's just very, very useful in practice. And again, some of these models have been made public. There's a distill bird, a distill Roberta. Um, you know, we found distill Roberta to be very useful. Um, so again, I'm going to talk, you know, at the end when I get through more of the models about what to use, but these smaller distilled models, they can do very well. Um, on, you know, depending on what your task is, they can potentially be as good as the larger model and they're just going to be much smaller, which means much cheaper and much easier um, to work with. Um, and so distillation is, is um, super useful to know about. Okay. You know, there's other, I would say that distillation is probably like what's taken off the most um, in terms of small models, but there's other techniques um, as well. Um, and so kind of the main other lightweight option um, is parameter sharing. And so one example of that is Albert, um, but there's kind of other models out there that also do parameter sharing. Um, and so it shares parameters between the transformer layers and that reduces parameters in the model by 
Um, another thing you know that it tries is using small embeddings for the input vectors. Um, so typically, um, the input vectors and the hidden state representations are 768 dimensions, and in Albert Base, they're 128 dimensions. Um, let's see, so that reduces the parameter size also quite dramatically. Um, you can scale up the size of the hidden representations while still sharing parameters. So there's an Albert extra extra large that scales the hidden representations all the way up to 4096, um, but it can still have less parameters than BERT base, which is going to have 768 dimensional hidden representations uh, by virtue of parameter sharing. Um, and the extra extra large um, you know, does pretty well, showing that you can do well with parameter sharing. Um, and the smaller versions do modestly worse than BERT, but with far fewer parameters. All right, I know I'm going through a lot of models here, but that's just kind of the reality of this space. And it's interesting to see kind of different ways they do things. So I think, you know, using Roberta would be a very reasonable thing to you. Using distill Roberta would be a reasonable thing to do. Another people that you'll uh, sorry another model that you'll see people talk a lot about is called Deberta, um, which you know, the technical details aren't too central, but kind of in brief, it uses a disentangled attention mechanism where each word is represented using two vectors that encode its content and position respectively, and the attention weights among words are computed using disentangled matrices on their contents and relative positions. Um, and also it uh, you, does decoding a little bit different. Um, so it argues that you can train on half the data and perform well on downstream tasks. Okay, so going in the other direction from, um, from Albert um, is, is T5, um, which is a text-to-text -text transformer by Google um, T5 is an encoder decoder model. Um, so now we're back to having both the encoder and the decoder. Um, and the argument of T5 is that every NLP model can be treated as text to text. So it produces text as output for all tasks. That's the decoder side. Even those like classification that don't normally have a text output. Um, it's trained on a mixture of supervised and unsupervised tasks, and the model understands what task is to be performed with a task-specific prefix added to the original sentence. So like translate French to English, summarize, etc. Um, so this is showing a representation of that. Translate English to German. This is good. Um, and then there's kind of other examples, you know, summarize, um, etc. So uh, T5 was trained on something called Colossal Clean Crawl Corpus, um, which is now used um, pretty frequently. Um, and so it's, you know, basically like the public domain internet, but there's significant cleaning you need to do because when you just scrape all that data, it's, it's pretty messy. Um, the largest T5 is 11 billion parameters. Um, and it achieves state-of-the-art with its large model by, you know, training this very large neural network on an enormous unlabeled data set and then fine-tuning on small labeled data. Um, and the entire literature has shown that kind of with this general approach, you can achieve really impressive results that I think people kind of in the pre-transformer era would have definitely not thought were possible. Okay. So now I want to say a word about um, some models that do attention a bit differently. Um, so computing attention in the transformer, remember that's um, uh, order n squared in the length of the input sequence. So BERT limits the length of the input sequence to 512 tokens. Um, and so when the model is training, like let's forget about inference for the moment, but when the model is training, you know, you just chunk up you know, the entirety of the internet into 512, um, you know, uh, token length segments, um, you know, they can't exceed that. Um, and this is kind of true, like, uh, more, more generally, that there's a limit to how much text you can put in at once, and there's no way to attend across these segments. Um, and um, so this is kind of a standard attention computation, 
um, you know, and you're training it and you're chunking it up into segments um, that have a max length. Um, and so there's a model called Transformer XL that introduces two features to overcome the above shortcomings, um, a recurrence mechanism and a relative positional encoding. Um, so to integrate in long-term dependencies and training, each hidden layer of the transformer receives two input, the output from the previous hidden layer of that segment that's just like in BERT and like in the original transformer, um, but also the output of the previous hidden layer from the previous segment to create long-term dependencies. Um, and so this is a visual representation of that, right? And so now kind of instead of um, you know, having these, these chunks where segment one of text, segment two, they never see each other. There's no way to have long-term dependencies. Um, you allow it to have um, these, these dependencies um, because um, the two inputs, you know, from the previous hidden layer in this chunk and the previous hidden layer in the previous chunk are concatenated, and then that concatenated vector is used to calculate the key and the value matrices of the current head of the current layer. Um, all right, so the original positional encoding handles each segment separately, and as a result, tokens from different segments will have the same positional encoding, right? Um, and so, for example, the first token of the first and the second segments will have the same encoding, although their positions and importance are obviously different because one of them was like way back in the previous segment. Um, and so the paper presents a new positional encoding that is part of each attention module, as opposed to encoding position only before the first layer, and is based on the relative distance between tokens and not their absolute position. Um, and this entails incorporating several learn factors. All right. Um, so there's a model called XLNet that uses Transformers XL with its main contributions being a novel training objective. So BERT and ELMO improve state of the art uh, by incorporating right and left context. XLNet takes this further by predicting each word in a sequence using any combination of other words in the sequence. Um, and so this gives, you know, the, the idea of this is you can squeeze out kind of every last signal from the training data because you're presenting it with difficult and in sometimes ambiguous contexts from which to infer whether or not a word is in a sentence. Um, so let me try to give a, a clear example of this. So if we have an autoregressive language model like GPT, um, you're predicting um, what word comes next based on the previous context. If we have BERT, it's bi-directional and we're kind of masking out certain words and predicting them based on the context in both directions. Um, now what XLNet does is, let's say that we have a sequence and that it has four tokens. Now consider the set of all, you know, four factorial permutations. Uh, the XLNet model is auto-regressive over all such permutations. Um, we're obviously going to sample them because once you have 512 tokens, um, 512 factorial is a very large number. So we're going to sample from the, all the potential permutations um, that can be taken of the sequence. Um, so let's consider an example. So we have, um, you know, we had one, two, three, four. Um, where one's the first word, two is the second word, three is the third word, four is the fourth word, and we take permutation of that. Um, so now we have three, the ordering is three, two, four, one. Um, and um, so when calculating the probability of the first element, token three, the model has no context, right? Because that's the first thing it's seen is token three. And so effectively our mask is zero, 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 right? It can't see any of the other uh, tokens in the sentence because token three is the first one we look at. Um, now we look at token two, our attention mask is over the one, two, three, four sequence is zero, zero, one, zero, because it's seen token three, right? Because how we permuted it, token three came first. Following that logic, for the third element, the attention mask is zero, one, one, zero, because now it's seen token two and token three, because those came before four in our permutation. And then finally, to predict the first token is now seen um, uh, two, three, and four. So the attention mask is effectively zero, one, one, one. And stacking all those in the token orders gives our attention matrix.
Um, so the problem with this is that it takes a long time to train um, because you're taking all of these uh, permutations. So, you know, I don't see XLNet used a lot, um, but there is a model called MPNet, um, which is by Microsoft and updates XLNet by combining mass language models and permuted language model objectives um, and has some good results. Um, and we've, we've used that for some, some things. And so that's another model to be aware of. So I'm not gonna go into the details about how it combines this mass language model objective and the permuted one that you just saw with XLNet um, but, you know, using MPNet again could be like a reasonable thing to do. All right. Um, so, you know, I've talked with Transformers XL about how in training you're able to have these long range dependencies. Um, but suppose you just have much longer text that you want to use um, at inference time. Um, there's a couple of models called Longformer and Big Bird um, that have been designed to, to, to kind of deal with that. Um, if you really need to have more than 512 tokens. Um, and um, so we're not gonna be able to have um, global cross attention over large context windows, right? Cause then that just, that blows up um, since it's order n squared. And so what long former does is to use an attention sliding window of size W um, and this allows a multi-layer transformer model to have a receptive field that covers the entire document. And the intuition here is just analogous to CNNs as convolutions, right, are just sliding windows across an image. Um, this is um, doing attention as a sliding window. Um, and so attention is a sliding window across the text. So just essentially think of it as, as convolutions and your receptive field kind of is... Um, increasing as you pass it through um, the transformer for the same reason that when we were talking about um, ConvNets um, and we talked about how kind of one of the innovations of VGG was to realize, you know, you could take a smaller uh, window, a smaller convolution, but a deeper network and have the same receptive field. Um, and um, so... Um, in practice, it also has global cross attention to the class token, which is supposed to be aggregate the entire sequence into a single representation. And so you see like the global cross attention of the class token combined with the, um, the sliding window attention. Um, and that's still far less parameters than the full n squared attention. All right. So there's another more recent model called Big Bird, continuing the Muppet theme. Um, and um, so it has a tension that is order n, and it does this by combining together random attention, sliding window attention, and that global attention um, for uh, uh, the special tokens, like the class token. Um, all right, um, you know, so I will say that I think that these long text models have a reputation of not really working that well. Um, and so kind of rather than going down that route in general, I would recommend finding a way to frame your task so you don't need long texts um, because kind of at the end of the day, it's just, it's hard to have kind of global attention to have a representation that can really capture like the context of a word and like <laughs> capture very long range dependencies or it's hard to have a single vector like a class token that represents a, a, a long document. Um, and so in general, I would think about ways to frame your task such that you don't need to have cross attention across long documents. All right. Um, so now I want to have some discussion of these models. Um, so first of all, why have transformers come to document language modeling? Um, well, 
First of all, self-attention removes locality bias. So by design, an LSTM plays the most attention to the close context, the very close context. But remember, um, as we uh, kind of saw last week, uh, human language um, by nature depends on these long-run dependencies. Um, and to do things like generating coherent text, you really need to be able to account for longer range dependencies. As long as we're it's within the sequence window, which is actually like 512 tokens of approximately 512 words. That's, that's a lot of text. As long as it's within that sequence window, which is allows for pretty long range dependencies, um, long distance context has equal opportunity to be important in the transformer. And that's just really central for capturing human language. And then importantly, the entire input can be processed in parallel, whereas an LSTM requires sequential processing. And so this means that the parallel compute power of GPUs can be fully harnessed, allowing for massively larger models to be trained. All right, so one of the clearest lessons to emerge from this literature is that bigger models trained on more data with a larger batch size for longer achieve state-of-the-art on a variety of downstream tasks. And the performance gains, I mean, you still see them with GPT-3, right? <laughs> Getting into the range of 175 billion parameters. I think most people, if you'd asked them before, you know, they would have thought that the performance gains are going to asymptote out before that. Um, but you see this even with very large models. Of course, your mileage may vary. And this is particularly true when fine-tuning on small data sets that differ from what the model was pre-trained on. You're just not going to have enough labels to leverage the capacity of kind of some massive model if you're trying to do a straightforward task that's nevertheless kind of quite different from what it's trained on, which I think describes a lot of our tasks. And so, you know, despite this bigger is better theme, like, dude, I would recommend that you don't go out and try to download the largest model that you can fit in memory. I'd go the other way and take a small model and see if that meets your needs first because it's going to be easier to work with and cheaper to work with. Um, but this is the bigger is better effect of model size. This is taken out to, you know, hundreds of millions of parameters. But I said even with GPT-3, it has absolutely massive 175 billion parameters. And in terms of being able to do text generation, I mean, it's just, you know, blowing smaller models out of the water. So T5 did a bunch of ablation studies to try to understand which features matter. They looked at model size, amount of training data, domain noise and training data, pre-training objectives, ensembling, details of the fine-tuning, multitask training. Um, and so essentially they could do this only because they're Google and they have like a massive amount of compute. Um, and the only thing that made much of a difference were model size and the amount of training data. Um, so their best model had 11 billion parameters, um, trained on 120 billion words of uh, clean, common crawl text. Um, you know, even models like Albert, you know, this was a, like a lighter language model, um, but it was actually trained for significantly longer than BERT. You know, but as I said, being light in terms of parameters is still very beneficial in terms of being able to deploy it much more cheaply um, or fine tune it um, more easily for cheaper, maybe on your local machine or on a, you know, a, a, a cheap collab plan. Um, and performance differences, when we say bigger is better, like remember that these never have standard errors on them um, and they could be pretty marginal. Um, so even if bigger is slightly better, you know, you have to decide if it's worth the additional challenges. Okay, so before the past few years, it was common to design different highly customized architectures for different types of downstream language tasks, and they could be highly specialized. The transformer-based language models just completely overturn that paradigm, and they provide a way to fine-tune most downstream tasks that you want to do within the architecture of the language model. Um, and so as, you know, as I showed you in those figures about BERT, okay, you want to do text classification, you know, to say, what topic is this text? Um, you just put a, a fully connected layer and a softmax classifier, 
um, onto the class token. If you want to say does A until B, you just you can concatenate them together, have a separation token, and again have like um, that classifier on the class token. If you want to do um, named entity recognition, recognizing which spans of text correspond to different entities, uh, then that's just done over the um, uh, the text tokens instead of using the class token and so on and so forth. So pretty much any task you could think of, you just stack the appropriate Lego block onto your transformer language model and do it, which is just amazing. Like you really don't have to know that much <laughs> to do just about anything compared to like, you know, if you're trying to do this like, you know, um, six or seven years ago, you'd actually have to know a lot more to do something that wouldn't work as well. I mean, so there's really like no reason not to use transformer language models and use them appropriately um, because it's actually really like about as straightforward as it, as it could be. And you can really do a lot of different things once you understand the basics of how these models work. Um, so again, this is just showing the figure I showed earlier and how you can do all these different downstream tasks um, from, you know, uh, within the architecture of the language model. And again, when you train these, I mean, you could freeze the language, the layers of the transformer, but usually you're going to, you're going to allow them to, to update as well. All right. So bottom line, pre-trained language models work extremely well for downstream tasks. Um, and the main thing that that the literature has found makes them work better is building bigger models, train for longer on more data. That's very expensive. Um, fortunately, organizations like Google, Facebook, Microsoft have a lot of resources and a business incentive to pre-train them and have largely open sourced their innovations. Um, you know, of course, they do lots of things that they don't open source that are specific to their commercial objectives, but kind of the major scientific <laughs> achievements and advances of like coming up with this architecture and having this pre-trained model like that's all been open source and you can just go to hugging face and work with it um distillation parameter sharing makes it easier cheaper to do inference and fine tune on commodity hardware um and these models remove the need to design lots of customized architectures for downstream tasks which actually makes it massively easier to do state-of-the-art nlp so what to use? Um, different models have different architectures. Uh, they, they train in different ways. Remember how we saw Bert did next sentence prediction, Roberto didn't, you know, and then XLNet had this, um, uh, you know, ability to let the previous chunks influence the current chunks. And um, MPNet did this permuted training along with the mass language model training. So there's in short, there's all these differences. Um, and the papers say something about differences with other models, um, but it's far from comprehensive. It's really expensive. If it's, you know, you're training a massive language model, you just can't train it like a bunch of different times. It's just way too expensive. Even if you're Google, it's way too expensive. Um, so hence the influence of these different factors, which will presumably kind of matter differentially for different downstream tasks is completed. Um, so we don't know if better is externally valid. We don't know if better is statistically significant because um, we don't have any way to quantify uncertainty at present um, over the predictions. Um, so ideally, you will do ablations using different pre-trained language models. And if you're using something like the sentence BERT library, which we're going to see is going to come up over and over again in applications, it's actually relatively straightforward to do that. Okay. So the first thing I would ask yourself, is there a pre-trained model that approximates your task? You know, so if you're working with Twitter data, you might want to use BERT tweet or there's a Roberta tweet, you know, a model that was trained on tweets. And it's very likely going to do better on tweets than a model that was not trained on tweets. Um, you know, if you want to do semantic similarity, you might want to use an SBIRT model that was pre-trained on... Uh, Quora duplicate questions, um, which is a semantic similarity task. So first of all, ask yourself if there's a model out there um, that approximates your task, and if so, use that. Um, if you're fine tuning on a straightforward task, the gains from a larger model might be minimal. Um, 
There is a general consensus that the models for longer tasks with sparse attention mechanisms tend to not work great. Um, so also really ask yourself, do I really need to feed longer text in all at once? Or is 512 tokens enough for me? Um, if you're going to be fine tuning unlimited data, then it's quite different from the data used for pre-training. I would recommend definitely starting with a lot of lar with a smaller model like Roberta Distil, Distil or XPNet, um, or sorry, MPNet, um, and um, you know see if that's sufficient because larger models are going to cost more and take longer and potentially be a significantly more of a headache to train. You have to worry about fitting them in memory. Um, if you want to do something zero shot, so you're not needing to train the model, then there's likely to be gains from larger models. Um, and it's also going to be a bit easier to work with because you're not trying to train it. You just need to use it off the shelf. Um, and so I would kind of think about that distinction. If you're going to be customizing something with your own relatively modestly sized labeled data set, start small if you want it to work well off the shelf because your task is pretty similar to what it was trained on and you don't think, you know, you think, well, maybe I don't need labels because my data really looks like what this was trained on, um, then larger can be oftentimes better. All right. Um, I want to make one, you know, final note about cross encoders and bi encoders, and we're going to see these um, a lot <laughs> over and over again when we talk about applications. Um, so you don't have to understand everything now, but I just want to kind of um, introduce you guys to these now because they're going to be important later on when we get to the applications. So many, many tasks in NLP involve relationships between two or more texts. So you might ask, are these two texts about the same topic? Are these two texts about the same topic? Are they written by the same person? Are they published in the same year? Does text A imply text B? Uh, which of a selection of texts is the answer to a question? Is text A a translation of text B? Which texts from a database are about a given query? Just lots and lots and lots of tasks that you might want to do are really about the relationship between two or more texts. Um, so one solution, which you guys already saw in the BERT paper with that figure, is to concatenate pairs of texts with a SEP uh, token in between and run them through BERT. Um, and this is, allows cross attention between the two texts, which oftentimes leads to accurate results. Uh, but unfortunately, um, if you have in text, it requires embedding in squared pairs, and that's very quickly going to become computationally infeasible if you want to compare 10 million texts to each other. That's 10 to the 14th embeddings. Like you cannot embed 10 to the 14th things, um, you know, through a model with 130 million parameters. That's just completely and totally infeasible. And so the um, cross encoders um, are, you know, which I showed here, cross encoders are great if n is small, but as n starts to get bigger, you know, not going to happen. Um, another downside is that you may be interested in multiple pairs of text. So suppose you have, you want to know if A, B, and C um, all come from the same source. So you could do compare, you, you could jointly embed A and B and B and C and A and C, but the problem is then you can get these intransitivities. So you say A is the same as B and B is the same as C, but A is not the same as C and you have to somehow resolve those, right? And so that's kind of like inelegant and it just doesn't feel kind of that appealing um, to, to have those intransitivities. And so those are both sort of disadvantages of the cross encoder. A commonly used alternative is a bi encoder. So you separately encode two texts. You separately pass them through BERT. Then you're going to take a pooling layer to get a fixed size embedding. You could use the class token, um, but there's an entire literature showing instead of using the class token, just pool, like take mean average pooling. So take an average of the, the, rep, the representations of um, the um, individual tokens. So just pool them. Um, and that gives you your representation of sentence A and sentence B. And then you compare the two embeddings with cosine similarity or some other distance metric. And that will tell you um, uh, whether they're the same or not. So a bi-encoder gives 
an embedding for each text. And that means that each text only has to be embedded once. And then the same embedding can be used to compare to any other texts. So there's no need to re-embed every time. So if you wanna compare 10 million things, you only have to embed 10 million texts, which is actually a feasible thing to do. You're still gonna to have to make 10 to the 14th cosine similarity calculations, uh, but fortunately, you can do that in about three hours on a single GPU card. Um, it's, you know, it's much, much, much um, faster to calculate cosine similarity um, than it is to embed 10 to the 14th things, which is completely and totally infeasible. Um, so the vector space produced by a bi-encoder can be seen as a metric space, and that can be meaningful for downstream tasks. You can apply standard clustering algorithms over these embeddings or do dimensionality reduction um, to visualize them. Um, we will see examples of both symmetric and asymmetric bi-encoders. So symmetric bi-encoders fix the weights for both sides of the model to be the same. Um, so um, as you're training the model, um, to kind of embed two things that are um, the same, to give them the same representation, that you fix the weights on both of those to be the same. Um, and applications are usually when all texts are of the same type. So things like semantic textual similarity, dupli duplicate detection, topic clustering. Uh, there's also asymmetric bi-encoders, which allow different weights for two sides of the model. Um, and so you see this a lot with uh, retrieval where you have a query and then you have a passage and you want to know if uh, the passage um, is um, entailed by the query. Um, you see this with natural language inference. Um, you see this um, uh, with kind of various types of retrieval. Um, so um, is this entity, the named entity that you've identified in the text, which Wikipedia uh, page does it correspond to? Um, all right, um, so I do I just want to say a word about how we would train um, a bi-encoder. Um, and again, we're going to come back and have kind of a whole lecture about this, but I want to give a flavor for where we're going. Um, and so um, your training data is for pairs or groups of text with labels of the distance between them. It could be a continuous distance between zero and one. Um, it could be a discrete distance, so they're the same at zero and they're different at one, or they could be ordinal distances. B is closer to A than C is to A. And based on what your labels look like, then you're going to have different training objectives. Um, so the general idea is we want to push the representations, which remember is just the mean average pooling of all the tokens in that text. Um, we want to push the embeddings of two texts closer together if they should be closer together for our task. So if A entails B, um, we want them to be nearby and push them apart um, if they're different. Um, so we need some loss function that penalizes the model if either of these are not the case. Um, and there's different loss functions that have been proposed to do this. And again, we'll spend a whole class talking about this because this is something that gets used over and over again. By the way, you also use these loss functions in vision applications, uh, which we'll also see. Um, so there's cosine loss, um, which is for when you have a continuous label and the loss is just the label minus the cosine similarity between them. Um, there's contrastive loss, um, where your data are a list of input samples, each with a corresponding label among C classes. Um, and um, you take a pair of inputs and you minimize the embedding distance when they're from the same class and maximize when they're from different classes. Um, there's triplet loss, um, where you have data on an anchor X with one positive sample and one negative sample. And you're learning to minimize the distance between the anchor and the positive sample and maximize the distance between the anchor and the negative sample. And you have some um, margin parameter that's configured as the minimum offset um, between distances of similar versus dissimilar pairs. Um, and then finally, there's supervised contrastive loss, um, which can be seen as a version of triplet loss where you have multiple positives and negatives. Um, and so again, um, we're going to come back um, later in the class when we talk about how to optimize deep neural networks. And we're going to talk a lot about these loss functions because along with the classification loss um, that you've already seen and regression loss, um, uh, 
these loss functions are used very, very, very commonly um, throughout deep learning. Um, when you're training this kind of model, um, it's really important to have what are called hard negatives. Um, so um, hard negatives are samples that are negatives, but they're difficult to distinguish. Um, and so you might explicitly label hard negatives um, or you might mine them by training the model for a certain uh, number of epochs with random negatives and then resampling the closest negatives. Um, so for example, um, you know, if you're training a model to detect whether two texts come from the same source or from different sources, if you have two texts about the same topic, but they're a little bit different because they're from a different source, then that would be a hard negative. So it's a negative, but it's more difficult to distinguish. And obviously your model needs to see lots of these difficult to distinguish negatives in order to be able to perform well. All right. So for some applications, you can actually get the best of both worlds. So the speed of a bi-encoder and the accuracy of a cross-encoder by using a bi-encoder to create a short list of candidate pairs and then to use a cross encoder. And so we see this a lot in open domain retrieval where you have a query that you want to run over all of Wikipedia. Um, and so obviously you wouldn't be able to re-embed all of Wikipedia each time you have a different query. Instead, you can embed Wikipedia once um, and embed your query and then you use a bi-encoder to get say the top 10 most likely articles in Wikipedia that the query refers to and then you um, use a cross encoder where you jointly embed the query with just those 10 articles that are most likely. And then that's, you know, very computationally cheap, but you can get a slightly better accuracy by being able to have the cross attention um, between um, your query and your passage by jointly embedding them instead of having just one representation of each. Um, and so again, we'll be spending, you know, all these applications I'm mentioning very briefly, we'll be spending a lot of time on them later in the course, but I wanted to give you a flavor for that now. Um, there's a SIN transformers library, which if you do NLP um, is really one of the most useful things out there. Um, it has, um, uh, easy to use, very computationally efficient implementations for both bi-encoders and cross-encoders, as well as good documentation um, and pre-trained models. All right, um, so that's all for uh, transformer language models, and I really look forward to talking more about all of this in class on Thursday. Thank you.